So I'm delighted to introduce Pablo Azar from MIT. He's a student working with Sylvia McCauley, and he's uh, going to be visiting us at Northwestern in the Netherlands for the next two weeks. So I uh, take advantage of his being around to follow up with questions over, over the course of the week. Today he's going to be talking to us about rational proofs. Thanks, Jason. I'm glad to be here to talk about rational proofs. And rational proofs are a type of interactive proof. And the central question in this field is for which problems can an expert who has unlimited computational power convince a user who is very computationally limited that a theorem is true? And we want to know which problems have efficient proofs. And by efficient, I mean that they take few rounds, that they have um, little communication between the expert and the user, and that they take a limited amount of time. And this concept of proof was um, discovered in the 1980s, um, and the two very important complexity classes were defined, interactive proofs by um, Goldwasser, Mikhail, and Rakoff, and Arthur Merlin proofs, which is where these characters come from, by Babay and Moran. And once these classes were defined, there was a lot of work in the late 80s and early 90s towards showing for which problems can we give an efficient interactive proof. So in this, um, in this case, efficient means with polynomial rounds, with polynomial complexity, and with a polynomial amount of time that the user needs to verify the proof. And this was a lot of work that happened in the late 80s and early 90s um, that led to the proof of IP equals P space. And this is a great story. It allows us to give interactive proofs for a very, very large class of problems. And this, it's a great story, but it's not the story that I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about a story that happens many centuries later. <laughs> and what happens is Arthur comes to Merlin as usual with a problem. I have this language L, and I have this input X, and I want to know whether X is in this language. Just like we've done hundreds of thousands of times before through the centuries. But this time Merlin says, go to hell. Arthur recalling in shock, says, I thought you were my friend. Why are you doing this to me? And the thing is, all of Merlin's friends from grad school, Dumbledore, Gandalf, Harry Potter, they all went to work for these big Wall Street banks in New York. <laughs> and now Merlin wants money. He's an expert mathematician. He wants to get paid for his work. Arthur, being very, very generous and very, very rich, he's a king after all, proposes a new scheme. He says, give me a proof as before, and I'm going to verify it. So we do the same thing we did before. For those of you who know, we're going to um, have some polynomials over finite fields and choose some random numbers in these finite fields and have some rounds of interaction so that Arthur can verify um, whether Merlin's proof is correct or not. And if the proof is correct, Arthur will pay him a dollar or any multiple of a dollar that Merlin wants. And if the proof is incorrect, because of this shock that Arthur had, he says, now I trust you even less. I'm going to keep an eye and verify your proof. And if it's incorrect, I'll pay you zero dollars. So they go on for a few days, and they prove things the old way. But now there's one dollar for verification, zero dollars if the proof doesn't verify, until Arthur has an idea. And his idea is that if Merlin cares about money so much, then maybe we can do things better than before. So Arthur tries to come up with a scheme where he can either prove more theorems, or maybe he can prove them faster. He doesn't need all this machinery and polynomial number of rounds and communication that he had before. And in particular, what I'm going to show in this talk is that if we introduce money, then we can get interactive proofs with fewer rounds. 
And our central question in this talk is going to be, what is the largest class of problems for which we can verify the correctness using monetary incentives, or guarantee the correctness using monetary incentives? Now, this is a theory talk. So I need any questions so far? Because it is a theory talk, I need to basically define what this class of problems is, and it's going to be a complexity class that we're going to define, which we're going to call rational Merlin Arthur. And a complexity class is just a set of languages, so we have to give a characterization of what languages in this set look like. So we say that a language L is in rational Merlin Arthur if it has associated two functions, an output function pi and a reward function r. And these two functions are going to help Merlin and Arthur interact. This is a talk about interactive proofs after all, so they better interact. So given a problem, again all our problems are going to be of the form some input x, which is a binary string, is in some language. Merlin is going to send some message y1. Arthur is going to reply with some public random coins R1. Merlin is going to send some other message Y2. Arthur is going to bounce back some random R2. And so on until they generate a complete transcript of their interaction. So this is just syntactic. I'm not telling what desirable behavior is. I'm not saying, hey, um, this is what people should do. I'm just saying any kind of interaction is going to look like this. <coughs> So I generate the transcript, and these two functions determine what the uh, user and the expert get from this proof. So Merlin gets some money, which depends on the problem that they're trying to solve and on their interaction. And Arthur gets some output that depends also on the problem and on the interaction. And one thing I'm going to say is that we haven't defined what desirable behavior is, and there's going to be no verification at all in these kinds of proofs. So there's not going to be, the transcript is not going to help convince Arthur that the problem is correct. It's going to serve, it's going to give him the answer to the problem, but he won't be able to verify it. And I'm going to get to that later. Yeah. Where is the, the case note that I decided to, to add here? And so it's, pre, it's a pre-specified protocol that they agree to play. So we're assuming Arthur is always honest in this case, and uh, the only one that can be dishonest is Merlin. So if Merlin deviates from this specified protocol, so for example, they can say we're going to, Merlin can say, I'm going to send you a message, mm -hmm. and Arthur sends some random coins, and then it's over. And if Merlin deviates in some way, he gets a payment of zero. Mm -hmm. um, that only guarantees that you're not deviating from the protocol rules, it doesn't guarantee you're going to give wrong messages, but you're not going to give a thousand messages when the protocol only asks for two, or two when the protocol asks for a thousand. So what is this terrible behavior? Like, how is this going, how is this going to proceed? Well, if you are Merlin, and remember Merlin has money on his mind, this now becomes something like a game. And Merlin's actions in this game are his messages y1, y2, y3, yk. And by controlling this wise, he actually controls the whole transcript. Because we trust Arthur to be honest and to send us random coins. So the transcript is going to be a random variable, which is completely determined only by Merlin's messages y1, yk. And if you have money on your mind and you want to maximize your money, you better choose some transcript P star that maximizes your expected reward or the expectations from this transcript. So that's what Merlin wants. Any, any questions about that? <clears throat> what Arthur wants is he wants to solve his problem. So he <coughs> wants to know if I have some input x, is it in this language L? So it better be that if Merlin is getting what he wants, which is to maximize his money, that from this transcript this star, Arthur also learn what he wants, which is whether this input x is in the language L, or the answer to this problem. 
So this T star has to doubly satisfy that it maximizes the expected reward. And also, when with this special predicate that Arthur has, it becomes a, it becomes some advice for Arthur that helps him solve a problem he couldn't solve before. This is all informal intuition. I'm going to give formal definitions when uh, when I prove the theorems, but this is informal intuition. Okay, so you're saying yeah. that X is in L if there exists a transcript mm -hmm. that simultaneously simultaneously maximizes Merlin's revenue function. Uh, no, that's that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying um, the language has a rational proof if there exists these functions r and pi and if x is in l the tr the, there's going to be a unique transcript that maximizes the expected reward there's always for whatever x is there's always going to be a unique transcript that maximizes the expected reward um, the, the theorems will work with unique it doesn't need to be unique but for, for simplicity let's say it's unique so there's a unique transcript T star that maximizes the expected reward. And when you plug it into this function, it either tells you, yes, x is in L, or it tells you x is not in L, depending on what the right answer is. Does that answer your question? Or? Yeah, I just missed both yeah. yeah. What is the transcript again? Um, so the transcript, we're going to have to construct what this interaction is going to look like. Um, but Right now, it's very general. It's basically Merlin is going to send some polynomial size message. Arthur is going to send some polynomial and uniformly random coins. And Merlin is going to send another message, and so forth and so on. And so we're going to, when we do the construction of the rational proof, it's going to yield a unique transcript. Um, but, um, sorry, what's your name? Me. Me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So his question um, about does the transcript need to be unique? It doesn't need to be unique as long as any transcript that maximizes this reward also satisfies that when you plug it into this output function, it tells you whether x is in the language or not. And that only holds with some high probability. Um, that holds with 100% probability. So it, it always holds. But we, it's not why do you bother having random coins? Oh, we have random coins. That's a very good question. Um, we have random coins, so this reward is randomized. So we're making bets with the expert about um, the outputs of our functions. And you'll see that for the one round case, if we don't have random coins, we just ha this definition becomes NP. Um, but if we add random coins, we get something much, much higher. <coughs> And everyone can compute r and pi? Yes. So everybody knows what r and pi are. <clears throat> and they're polynomial time randomized functions. But if t stars unique, then those random r1, r2 must be unique as well. Mm. <coughs> yeah. You don't have randomized, <laughs> you don't have expectation. <laughs> if that's the case, then np equals sharp p. No. <laughs> And, um, I mean, if that's, a, if, if that's the case, it's interesting. And, but um, you'll see in the one round proof uh -huh. that randomness is necessary and you will still have a unique transcript. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think that's going to be the case that the randomness has to be unique or that we don't need randomness. If we don't, maybe interesting things happen, but I don't think interestingly impossible things happen. Okay. Any other questions about this? Great. So, as I said, this is an informal definition of this class, Rational Merlin Arthur. I'm going to give a formal definition when the time for proofs comes. And with this definition in hand, our central question, we can rephrase it as, where does this complexity class fit in this nice universe of complexity classes, credit where credit is due, the image is due to Dan Spielman from some MIT website. Um, but we really need to start asking, where does this complexity class fit? So 
the intuition I gave in the beginning where you can construct a rational proof from any interactive proof by paying one dollar um, if the proof verifies and zero if it doesn't says that rational proofs have to be at least as powerful as classical Merlin Arthur proofs when you have a constant number of rounds so but one thing that we could ask is are they very very low in the polynomial hierarchy this diagram might not be to scale classical Merlin Arthur so unbound rounds is it just p space? I'm sorry? Is unbound rounds it just p space? polynomial rounds it's p space um, and that's that's an easy result in the paper and um, so the interesting case is going to be a constant number of rounds um, um, we don't know so it's related to some counting problems um, so just as there are non-constant levels of the polynomial hierarchy there are going to be some non-constant levels in this hierarchy um, but um, I'll get to that near the end of the talk um, but the interesting case and the interesting comparisons are going to be in the constant case because we don't know that much about interactive proofs with logarithmically many rounds either so it could be as I said very very low in the polynomial hierarchy like classical Merlin Arthur proofs it so could the yeah classical Merlin Arthur proofs are exactly where um, I don't know exactly, but they are. I, I'm, I'm sure Lance knows better than I do. Yes, so it's somewhere in the second level, and for the precise where it is, um, Lance is a better expert than I am at that. But the intuition is it's it's very low. It could also be very high, somewhere between the polynomial hierarchy and p-space. Um, and it could even be outside p-space. Um, so it could be that if you introduce money, that um, I can have a payment scheme for you to prove problems in exponential time or non-deterministic exponential time. And in fact, if we have two experts, um, then uh, classical multi-interactive proof, multi-prover interactive proofs give us non-deterministic exponential time. And so the problem here is we only have one expert. So we can't play the experts against each other and verify one's mm -hmm. answers with the other one. We only have one expert. Well, the yes, this, this problem this problem did come from our work on crowdsourced auctions in a roundabout way. Um, so the question is, where does these rational proofs fit? And what I'm going to show you is we get rational proofs for sharp p. And as I've said before, here this question mark is very important um, because basically, as Lance pointed out, um, if you have polynomially many rounds, you get all of p space. So of course you get sharp p. And what we want to do is we want to reduce the number of rounds. So it's an open, interesting problem for classical interactive proofs, whether you can get interactive proofs for sharp p um, using less than polynomially many rounds, say square root of n rounds or log n or 64. And what we show for rational proofs is that we get exactly one round, the least amount of interactions possible for Sharpie problems. And this is our first theorem, and we're going to show what happens with more rounds. But first, I'm going to give you the proof for the one round case. And as a remark, um, this Sharpie is not in Merlin Arthur proofs with one round unless the polynomial hierarchy collapses. And we'll also show, because sharp e is not does not exactly contain the polynomial hierarchy, that the polynomial hierarchy also has rational Merlin Arthur proofs with one round. After we show sharp e. No, that, that is a corollary. That is a corollary. It, it's not a theorem. It's, it, it's not. It's not stated here. What? No, no. I mean, if you could show sharp e and yeah. RNA, then it yeah, I'm, I'm pointing it out now um, just to clear any um, confusion right. about this. 
<laughs> Are those taking my class? <laughs> Okay, so what I need to do is I, give, I need to give you a formal definition of rational proofs. I need to recall the definition of sharp P so that everything is consistent in the notation, and I need to prove the theorem. So I said formal definition, here comes an informal intuition for one round. That's very, very similar as before. And now we're having rational proofs for functions because we're comparing to sharp P. So we don't have proofs for languages, but it's basically the same idea. We have associated this reward and this output, and the transcript is just going to be one message that Merlin sends, and the output is going to be some randomized reward that Arthur sends back to Merlin based on the transcript Y. And Merlin chooses the transcript that maximizes his expected reward. And if Merlin chooses Y star, it better be that using this pi, Arthur can figure out what the right answer to f of x is. And one thing I want to point out, the randomness now is all going to be in this reward. So it's not like I'm explicitly giving you the randomness. I could if I wanted to, but I can also just, um, I can also just give you this reward based on some coins I flipped. That's an informal definition, any questions? In yeah. case of more than one round, maybe doesn't maybe the second choice of the y two may depend on the x one, right? Yeah, on the so yeah, so we can't like there's no randomness from the transcript in more than one no, round. and and that's why it's in the informal definition and in the yeah. formal definition it's also going to be um, the randomness on the transcript. For one round, it's much much simpler, and uh, it makes the rational proofs very intuitive. <clears throat> Okay, so there's a formal definition for those of you who like, I've been to some economic seminars where after all the cartoons they ask me for a formal definition. So there it is on the slide. A function has a one round rational proof if there exists some polynomial length and some reward r and output pi such that for every x there exists a unique certificate of this polynomial length and um, that maximizes the expected reward and when you plug that in it gives you a function. Okay, enough definitions, here's the proof. Anybody has not seen Sharpie in this audience? Good. So Sharpie, as you all, um, as you all know, we have a non-deterministic Turing machine. Um, we have some input X and we can take some non-deterministic choices and we want to count the number of paths of this computation that accept. So the number of green boxes in this slide. And for this type of proofs, we really, really don't know if we want the answer to a number of accepting paths. We don't know how to give a classical proof. And the best thing we know how to do is to give uh, all the input and output pairs from this <coughs> non-deterministic Turing machine. And so we really have no one run proof using the tools from computer science. So we're really going to need to leverage some tools from <clears throat> economics. And we're going to have economics to the rescue. And I want to pause here because this is actually, um, this group does a lot of work in economics and computer science. And um, there has been a lot of work on it on the last 10 or so years. And a lot of the interesting work that has been done has been applications from computer science to economics. So work in auctions, work in game theory. And this talk is not an economics talk. It's a talk about complexity classes. It has some intersection with economics because we're talking about proofs for money. But it's somewhat rarer to have, although, I mean, these results do exist, it's somewhat rare to have an application from economics to computer science. So when I told you that this talk was about interactive proofs, I only gave you half the truth. It's actually a talk about asymmetric information. So we have this user Arthur and this expert Merlin, and we really want to transmit some information from Merlin to Arthur. And the key is that 
when we talk about interactive proofs or we talk about asymmetric information economics, we have to define what information is and how do we guarantee it is correct. So the computer science view we've been talking about, information is a solution to a hard problem and the correctness is guaranteed by a proof. But in the economics view, information is a distribution over some set omega of states of the world. And the other view rarely exists because um, that culture doesn't work with um, computationally hard problems often. So to have something that is unknown, we need a distribution over some set of states of the world. And the correctness is going to come from incentives. So instead of giving you a proof that this is the true information, you're going to trust that I gave you um, the right answer because I want to maximize my own utility. So in this very simple case, there are much more complicated models in economics, of course, but this very simple case where the agent wants to transmit some information to the principal in form of a distribution, we can guarantee that this is correct using proper scoring rules. Any questions about this? This is all philosophy, so. <coughs> Who has seen proper scoring rules before? Okay. So for those of you who haven't seen it before, and for those of you who want a refresher, a proper scoring rule is a way to transmit information from an expert to a user. And in this example, there's going to be a self state of the world, which is going to be a baseball game. So Arthur wants to know who will win this baseball game tomorrow, either the Red Sox or the Chicago Cubs. And there's some true distribution of who will win this game. And because Merlin is an expert, he knows this distribution. So he knows Boston will win with probability 60%, and Chicago will win with probability 40%. And our goal is to transmit this information from the expert to the user. And this being an economic setting, the expert being rational, he has a whole set of actions that he can take. We don't trust the expert. He could tell us something different, like some other distribution P. And what we need to do is we need to prevent him from doing that. And right now in the model as it is, we have no way of doing that. What we need is some handle on what reality is. Right now, if he tells us Chicago will win with probability 100%, of course we believe him, because we have no handle on what's going to happen. So what we need is some handle on the truth, which is a sample from this distribution. And so tomorrow we both watch the baseball game and we see that the Cubs actually won. So given the expert's prediction P and the true outcome that got realized, we can give the expert a reward, which is a function S of the observable outcomes. So if Boston wins, he gets some reward. If Chicago wins, he gets some different reward. And the expert's utility is just the probability that Boston wins times the reward he gets if Boston wins, plus probability Chicago wins times the reward he gets if Chicago wins. And he wants to choose his prediction to maximize this expected reward given the rule that's being used to reward him. And any questions about this model? This is going to be central to our construction of rational proofs. Yeah, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So people have been constructing this type of scoring rules since um, the 1950s, at least. And in particular, the one we're going to use is the Breer scoring rule, which is here on the slide. And this has the good qualities that it's both truthful and bounded. So truthful meaning that the expert wants to give the true distribution and only the true distribution to maximize his reward. And bounded in that 
the range of rewards that we give is going to be for this particular one between minus two and zero. But we can always do a linear transformation to have be the rewards be between, let's say, $1 and $10. So we always give the expert a positive reward, but we don't give him infinity money. And I just want to point out that before we use this in a computational setting, I want to point out that this distribution D might be hard to encode. If there's exponentially many outcomes, then we're violating our requirement that communication be limited. And if, even if we could communicate this distribution, it might be hard to compute. Especially here, we have to sum over all the outcomes. And that will violate the fact that we have limited time. And um, what, what's your name? I'm sorry, time, time. As time pointed out, um, it's different settings. We don't really have any randomness in our computational complexity problems that we are solving in this talk. And here we have a distribution. So we need a way to reduce our problem to this one. And for one and two, I'm going to bypass them because we're not going to face these problems for applications. But um, we also have a result on how to uh, make computationally efficient scoring rules. And we show that all the known ones are computationally inefficient. Um, or they are the logarithmic scoring rule, for those of you who um, know. So they have an unbounded reward. And I'm going to talk about that at the University of Chicago in two weeks. Um, so if you're interested in how to make scoring rules easier to compute with, um, you're welcome to come to that. OK, rational proofs. We have to reduce our counting problems to these scoring rule distribution problems. So instead of asking how many accepting paths there are to this computation, we say, what's the probability that a uniformly random path in this non-deterministic Turing machine will accept? And Merlin, being all, all knowledgeable, takes his formula of 2 to the 301 plus 13 and just divides by the number of paths in this machine. So we reduce it to a question of probabilities. And now Merlin knows this number, which we want to compute. And we have to incentivize him to reveal it. So now you can see where scoring goals coming from. Our set of states of the world is going to be 0 and 1. And we have to define a distribution to solve this problem with scoring goals. Our distribution is going to be, what's the probability that a uniformly random path in this non-deterministic machine accept. Any questions so far? This is the construction of a rational proof. For one run. So, okay, so for yeah. use of like, uh, not functions, but for languages, like having a positive probability means that this is in the language, and having zero probability means that it's not. So you can define a situation like that. I mean, mm. You don't want to know whether a string is in a language, not like functions. Yeah. I mean, you can define the distribution the same way. Once you have the random yeah. uh, path. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, so that's that's what we do, and that's where the predicate is going to come in. So we have a predicate where you can plug in the transcript, and the predicate is going to basically go from this transcript, which is a number or a series of numbers, and just output one or zero. Does that answer your question? Well, it's like this. It's similar to it to make a distribution for this case, but like you no. want to know the no, no, no. Yeah, and like if you have both problems, if, like, if a distribution, we want, we want to know whether the distribution of the exponent that it's giving, it has, uh, if one has positive no, 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 no. probability or not. If it has both probability claims in the language, it doesn't have positive probability. Um, so for NP problems? Yeah, for NP problems. Yeah. 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 But for NP problems, we already have. Yeah. Uh, we're right at it also works for coin people and coins, EP problems. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's yes. okay. Is there a canonical way to write down the machine so you can just sample? Um that's Yeah, so that's what we're going to do and we're basically reducing in in this so what we do in the paper is we do 
we reduce any Sharpie problem to sharp sat and then we show that our rational proof um, basically preserves the number of solutions and the reductions but, but what we're going to do in this presentation is we're going to reduce it to counting the number of paths in and any Sharpie problem can be reduced in a way that preserves the number of solutions to um, to counting the number of accepting paths in a non-deterministic Turing machine. Given the large spread and the number of accepting paths you can imagine in a Turing machine, mm -hmm. um, can't imagine the incentives are very ridiculous. No, they aren't. And um, one application that we're looking at and so definitely the universe we're working in is where people care about about exact utility maximization which is something that um, people do study in economics and also in computer science applications to economics so we're looking at applications of this rational proofs model to um, other settings in auctions and mechanism design basically where the fact that the incentives are small and is compatible or at least will tell us and rational proofs can tell us about things we cannot do in those models for example so what you what you ask is true the incentives can be very small and there can be an exponential difference between um, the rewards you would get for different answers and that's the model we're working on is there anything you can imagine resolving that in a way that's more human? Um, yes. If if we so what, what one thing we're looking at is moving down to smaller complexity classes, mm -hmm. so reducing the power of both the verifier and the expert. Um, and in that setting, we're looking at whether we can um, remove this negligible difference in incentives and um, for this particular one um, not particularly that doesn't mean that um, we can't gain insights from this model into other things such as rational cryptography and mechanism design. Yeah. Thing, I don't know how much it's related to what Jason said but uh, if you assume that the expert is conventionally limited mm -hmm. and he may say that he wants to maximize his utility maybe if he's at a point, it's going to be hard for him to decide whether this is a local maximizing say, or of the utility or like the global. Mm -hmm. So you should like assume, because we want that ever, the only thing that you have to do is the right thing. Mm -hmm. Could that give you some problems? Like So, yes and no, in the sense that that's perfectly... So right now we're assuming the expert is um, infinitely powerful. Mm -hmm. um, we can also re reduce it to say the expert only knows how to solve Sharpie problems or whatever problem we're asking to solve. Um, and because we're also choosing the reward function, right? I'm basically telling you I'm going to pay you with the scoring rule, where what I'm going to do is um, a few multiplications and additions. You know what the scoring rule is, so it's like I'm choosing the function for you to make it easier for you to say that. To, so it's not like I'm giving you an arbitrary reward where it's going to be hard for you to determine as a problem in our maximum. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, so Jason asked about whether there's a way we can canonically sample this and um, as we need a sample from the distribution otherwise we don't know whether um, Merlin's telling the truth, he could tell us the machine always accepts, it always rejects and to get a sample, we can do that easily for Sharpie problems because we just take this uh, walk down this non deterministic machine until we find either a random box that accepts or rejects. And this gives us a sample from this distribution. And if you prefer to think about it in terms of satisfiability assignments, we just choose a uniformly random assignment to the formula and check if it's satisfied or not. Uh, the user. That's very important because 
one thing I'm going to talk about is the limitations of rational proofs. And how would the expert know that So in this model, we are trusting the user to, so in this model, as in also classical interactive proofs, zero knowledge proofs are a different thing. But in classical interactive proofs, we trust the honesty of the of Arthur, and it's Merlin who can be dishonest. Can you repeat that? Maybe there's a way that someone can commit to a Um Yes, but you should keep that string secret until the until the until the expert gives you his answer. I can't prove that I committed to it because I'm playing against Merlin. Yeah. Right? So if I didn't have like hash or any of these things yeah. Yeah. Like, Merlin's like, well, whatever. I don't do that. You can and convert all these things. You can agree on a public name of sorts. Yeah. That won't get revealed until after you know, stuff from space. Yes. Um, or if, if if you if you if you have synchronization, I mean that's that's not really a problem. We're, we're assuming Arthur can flip coins and we trust him, but um, we can also meet again and and flip coins over the phone. Um, I think it's an interesting question. Um, I mean it's a different model where we don't trust Arthur to be able to flip perfectly <coughs> random coins. If there was some no here we here we trust Arthur to flip coins. I'm, I'm sorry. You need pure random. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think this, this. I can't see how this proof I'm giving you works when the randomness, um, is not perfectly uniformly random coins. Um, do you think that? Uh, all right, all right. If Arthur wasn't going to be too cool about the coins, uh, if he could uh, explicitly uh, choose the coins twice, so as to to get basically the same answer with a smaller payoff. Then it's a more. This is a very decision theoretic model. It's a more game theoretic model, right? Where you have to um, say what what Arthur's rationality is, and and that's okay to model because our, you would be saying Arthur <coughs> lexicographically prefers to get the right answer, but then he prefers to pay less money. Right. Um, and in a way, that's a bit of a weird utility function. Like the model's okay to define, but then, um, I mean, it's it's interesting, but I can't see off the top of my head how it's, and it's an interesting model that Arthur would want to pay less. Okay, so with this distribution defined and this sampling procedure for Sharpie problems, we can give a rational proof, which basically looks like the interaction in a scoring group. Merlin's going to give some prediction p of what this box, whether this box will accept or reject. Arthur will give some reward that depends on the prediction and what the actual sample is. And if it's a scoring rule, Merlin will be incentivized to say exactly the true distribution, which encodes the number of accepting paths. That's a rational proof for Sharpie. And as a bonus for this one round rational proof, I have to tell you it's a zero knowledge proof with an honest um, verifier and the notion of a dishonest um, verifier we haven't explored it but there, there exists this concept of rational proofs with an honest verifier and Merlin gives a zero knowledge proof because he's only telling you the number of accepting paths. He's not telling you anything more about the problem. He's not giving you some table of different inputs and outputs to his function. He's only telling you the answer you want to know and nothing else. So it's perfect zero knowledge. And it's computationally sound um, because the extra information, so computationally sound proofs are a form of interactive proofs where the certificate for the answer is much, much shorter. So let's say logarithmic in the size of the problem. Here it's zero you get no extra communication besides the um, besides the answer to your problem, the number of accepting paths.
So that's our simplest rational proof. Here's where the actual fun starts. We have a second theorem and we put this corollary as part of the second theorem for the presentation that you can do p to the sharp p, that's immediate. At this p to the sharp p with one query to sharp p. If you have more than one query to sharp p, then you can't necessarily do that in one round. Um, but because basically we can do our computation when we need to ask our query, we just ask Merlin, and then we keep doing our computation and solve our p to the sharp p problem and in particular any problem in the polynomial hierarchy. And, but the, inter the more interesting part is that we give this very, very tight bound on what rational proofs can do. So you could imagine that our proof for sharp p was somewhat simple and that we could do even better, but the answer is we really can't do much better. So any problem that we can solve with a rational proof has to be in np to the sharp p. And just as a pithy quote, there are things that money can't buy. But also, um, another way to see it, which is an interesting area to explore, is from an economics view, it puts a computational limit on the contracts that you can enforce. So, why can't you just get the quality there by having Merlin um, give a proof? I mean, the NP part of the um, Non and then Arthur, unless Arthur accepts, he just doesn't give any, any reward. He only gives reward if he accepts and the reward for the contract. So you're saying to give RMA1 proofs for all problems in a future Sharpie? Sharpie 1. Sharpie 1. Which Sharpie 1 query? It doesn't matter. For NP. Mm. We, can, we can take it offline. That sounds interesting. Um, I hadn't thought of that. Um, but what is outside this NP? Um, outside NP to the sharp e. So we don't know, right? As in a lot of complexity theory, it's not only we don't know, and I can't, t and it's the same as the answer to our, or the other question. Um, we there are a lot of open questions about the power of this NP to the sharp e. So p to the sharp e was a big surprise that could do all of the polynomial hierarchy. And n p to the sharp e, um, we don't really have separations. We don't really have oracle separations for this one either. So a, a good way to give intuition that something that some complexity classes are different is saying, oh, these complexity classes are different relative to an oracle. And for p to the sharp e versus p space, right? Um, we don't have an oracle separation between p to the sharp e with respect to an oracle and p space with respect to that oracle. So, so we. Not, not that I know of. And so it would be really cool, right? If, if this was p space, we don't know, we don't, I don't think so, but. Um, but the I don't think so has a lot less evidence than a lot of other I don't think so as I could say about complexity theory. Um, so that's a good question. Um, I can give you a very quick proof, but before I do that, um, I got developed from this special union contracts, which basically, if you think of a contract, right, we can have very complicated contracts where I give you this book that you have to sign and you can enforce it somehow. We're really interested in working on contracts that are easy to enforce from a computational point of view. And these rational proofs could be a first step, in particular this result, to saying these problems that are more complicated than NP to sharp there's no way if we only meet once, that I can pay you and trust that you will enforce this contract, that you will do this contract, and I can guarantee that I'm enforcing in polynomial time. I can't compute your payment in polynomial time. So the proof of this, so there's a definition for languages, but basically what we need to do is 
we need to show that any language which has these associated reward and output functions is in NP2 HRP. And the hard part is finding this unique certificate that maximizes the expected reward. So we need to use our power to find this unique certificate. In the model, is it really, is it in the definition? So, as as I mentioned before, in the it, it has come up in seminar talks. Um, in in the paper, we defined it to be unique, but we don't need it to be unique. We just need it um, to satisfy this property. Does it need to be unique for what you're about to do? Um, I'll, I'll see, and our definition, so our definitions and constructions are with a unique um, certificate. So all, all that we do is coherent. Yeah, that's true, but this particular proof. For this particular proof, um, we can see as I do the proof. Right now I'm not 100% um, I'm not sure, and uh, I don't know if I'll be 100% sure when I'm done with that proof, but I think um, it's basically a binary search. Um, we'll see. I mean, it's a good question. What, what, I me what I meant by coherent is, if anything, we still have all the results talk about the same complexity class. Well, the complexity class should have the right definition. Sure. It should just be the code that makes it more. Sure. So, um, uniqueness doesn't seem like... Hey, I'd, I'd love to prove more results on rational proofs. So. Um, so basically we we define this function f which is just the expected reward you get on problem x if you give it a certificate y and it only takes um, exponentially many values and it can be computed in p to the sharp p with polynomially many queries to sharp p um, and I have a slide for that but basically you can compute the expectation of each bit of f in Sharpie. And then by linearity of expectation, you can just um, add the binary expression um, to get to recover f. And here's the proof. Given that you can compute this f in p to the Sharpie, you can also do a binary search over all the different certificates Y star um, to find the one that maximizes this function in NP to the sharp P. And I'm guessing that if you can look at all the certificates, I'm, I'm not sure. Let, let's take it offline. I mean, it's a good question. Um, I'm not sure whether you... What is binary search mean? Oh, my... So, basically, what, what's going on here is... Do you agree that we can compute this function in P to the sharp P? That's the why. Okay, so given that we can compute that function in P to the sharp E, we can, we need to find the Y star that maximizes this F of Y. Okay. And what we're going to do is this takes, let's say, a value between 0 and 2 to the K. And we're going to start at 2 to the K minus 1 with our value of are you going to do binary search yeah. through it? But it's not like you need P to the N to the Sharpie. How do you do the same thing? Um, P to the N to the Sharpie. Yes. Binary search. Every each query, binary search is in N to the Sharpie. You need the decision problem. Um, to find a Y star that has at least some. Yeah, so so that's that's a problem we're doing, and under the so yeah, so you, but you're not but you're not finding the Y star. 
Maybe no, because you, you need you need to you need to do multiple rounds of binary search. Um, so that's not. Um, so if you can compose the binary, if binary search is in P to the NP, then yeah, you need P to the NP to the sharp P. And um, we can take this also offline. Um, Okay, so results so far. Um, rational manly answer proofs with one round. Forget about the D. It means discrete. It was in a, a previous version of the talk. Rational manly answer proofs with one round are sandwiched between some low levels of the polynomial hierarchy with a Sharpie oracle. And this is only with one round, but I promised you more than one round. And remember, this was the intuition that we would have an interaction and we would generate this transcript. You give me the transcript that maximizes your expected reward, and it better tell me whether this exists in the language or not. So, our next question is what about two rounds or three or 64? Can we do better than these low levels of the polynomial hierarchy with some Sharpie oracle? And the answer is we can. And we get a very tight characterization of all. Um, of all rational proofs with constantly many rounds, and it's the counting hierarchy. So this being a hierarchy, this being a hierarchy, and um, we need to define the base level and some recursive definition. So the base level is PP, and PP is the same definition as Sharpie, except that now it's a decision problem, so that instead of counting the number of accepting paths, I output yes if there's more than half of the paths are accepting, and now it's less than half of the paths accept. And we can iterate, um, and we can give a recursive definition. And the one I'm going to give is that the second level of the counting hierarchy is going to be the same definition as PP, where I want to count the majority of the boxes. But instead of having a 1 and a 0 at the end, I'm going to make one query to a PP machine in each of these boxes. Any questions about this definition? So I'm defining the levels of the counting hierarchy, which is a polynomial, which is a counting analog to the polynomial hierarchy. And uh, we can um, we can recursively construct the kth level from the k minus first level. We just count the number of non-deterministic paths that at the end make an oracle call to the k minus first level. And um, we want to know whether the majority of these paths accept or not. So our last theorem says that this case level of the, well, this, sorry, rational proofs with k rounds contain the case level of the counting hierarchy and are containing the k plus first level. And this includes our previous results, but it also extends for all and um, constant number of rounds of rational proofs. And in the last three minutes that I have, I'll tell you why this is interesting, even if you never cared about money in the first place. Um, because one very interesting open question back from the early 90s and late 80s is, does this counting hierarchy collapse? Or does it have a separation relative to an oracle? So we know the polynomial hierarchy has a separation relative to an oracle, but we don't really know any analogous results for these counting problems. And it's very interesting because there are some parallels with um, threshold circuits that we would really know to know answers about. And these are very, very hard questions that, um, that are interesting to study, but that we don't believe will be solved um, in a very long time. But at least rational proofs can give us some intuition, we hope. And the old intuition is this counting hierarchy does not collapse because it behaves like the polynomial hierarchy. Instead of putting NP for the polynomial hierarchy, you put PP for the counting hierarchy, and you have some analogy. And the new analogy is that the counting hierarchy does collapse if it behaves like the Arthur Merlin hierarchy. So you have um, each level of the Arthur Merlin hierarchy collapses to the second level, and it could be the case because these levels of the counting hierarchy are analogous to levels of the uh, to rational probes with k rounds that this could 
collapse if rational Malin alpha behaves like classical Malin alpha. Now we've we've worked on this because that's the first thing we try, and the trick for making the classical Malin alpha hierarchy collapse and um, does not work in rational Malin alpha. So you need a trick of amplification in order to um, in order to make Arthur Merlin contain the Merlin Arthur class. And that trick, because we have these exponential differences in reward, where we don't have the Arthur Merlin, does not work. But maybe some different intuition can be gained about the counting hierarchy from this. Summary of contributions, new complexity class, very, very short rational proofs for sharp P, and a characterization of the counting hierarchy in terms of interactive proofs. Um, and one thing I want to point out is all our proofs are built with scoring rules. These are all the contracts that we need to construct even for higher level um, interactive proofs. Thanks. applications in uh, um, game theory and mechanisms and the practical living and harness of automation results. Um, we're also looking at, did you ask about like whatever, I mean, this is a pretty tight characterization of the hierarchy, at least for constant runs and for polynomially we have this space, but we haven't really looked at intermediate levels between constant and polynomial runs. Is that your question? 